Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the 2024 Sherwood Memorial Lecture in the history of science and technology. And as some of you would know, Professor Sherwood was a professor of modern Europe uh, from 1964 to 1986, uh, working on the history of science and technology. We are grateful to the Sherwood family, uh, especially John's widow, Joan Sherwood, for setting up this lecture series. And over the years, it has been a treat uh, organizing, attending uh, some of these talks. We usually reserve the front row for the Sherwood family. I don't see any of you there. So I'll be, I'll be in the front row, and we're all Sherwoods today, I guess. Um, you would know, uh, some of you would know that Joan uh, passed away last October. And before we uh, begin our uh, talk today, I would like to pay some tribute to uh, Dr. John, John Sherwood as well. After John's passing in 1986, Joan uh, started her own academic uh, career, having finished her master's at Columbia uh, before. The very next year, she published her first book in 1987, on wet nurses in Imperial Spain, um, 16th century. And then for many years, she taught at Queens and also at Concordia. Uh, Joan published her second book uh, at the age of 80. And the book uh, was titled Infection of the Innocents. And you'll see a reference copy over there on that table. Uh, you can go and have a look after the talk. Um, for, uh, since, coming, since arriving at Queen's, uh, for the first few years, I was responsible for organizing many of our lecture series, and it has been a pleasure working with Joan. I have many fond memories of meetings with her, and um, it is uh, lost to us as a department of former colleague. But I will now ask and request uh, Michelle Cheru, John and Joan's uh, daughter, to come up and say a few words. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I was just asked to say a couple of words about my parents and about the history of the lectureship. I guess, first of all, thinking about my dad, I think in a way both my parents were well ahead of their time in terms of their interests and their academic pursuits. My father was fascinated by technology and the impact of technology on human experience. He was concerned even 40 years ago about the inability of us you know, as human beings to keep up with the pace at which technology was changing our experience of the world. And I often think that he would have been very struck by all of the changes that have happened in the last 40 years and what we now know about what's happening to brain development and all kinds of other things. So, so that, was, that was his history and what's the kind of work that he was passionate about, particularly towards the end of his career. Um, my mother as well, as um, you touched on, was I think also in many ways very much ahead of her time. She actually started uh, in the late 50s at Columbia, which is where she met my dad. She'd gone back to school to do her master's degree at that time. And I think, and again, I think about how revolutionary it was in a lot of ways. She was passionate about seeing history through the lens of the poor, through the lens of women, through the lens of event of infants. So her, her work was done from that lens at a time when people really did not take that type of analysis seriously or care about it. So, so I just wanted to comment on that and to pay tribute to her and my dad for that reason as well. Um, I think fine, the last thing I would like to say is just that, that the thing about both my parents is that they were absolutely passionate teachers. Um, our house was filled with books, it was filled with discussion, we were filled with students. <laughs> you know, you never knew who you were going to wake up to find on the living room floor at any given time. Um, they were, uh, we were trained to analyze, to debate. Every dining room table conversation was a debate, really. And uh, I think that after my father died, what my mother really wanted to do was to create an opportunity for that debate to continue, for the exchange of ideas that they cared about so much to continue. And again, she was absolutely passionate about pursuing this and about providing this opportunity. So I thank all of you for attending this evening and you know for allowing all of us to participate and continue in that tradition. Thank you. 
Thank you, Bishop, for such a lovely tribute to your mother and our former colleague, uh, John Sherwood. Uh, now it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today, Dr. Dagomar de Groot, uh, Associate Professor of Environmental History at Georgetown University. Dr. de Groot's research straddles the humanities and natural sciences to explore how societies respond to abrupt environmental and climatic changes. He's deeply interested in the question of existential crisis of humanity and also how societies have turned uh, some of the climate-induced predicaments uh, into collective opportunities. A true interdisciplinary scholar, Dr. DeGroote's research has appeared in Nature, in the American Historical Review, and Environment Research Letters, among many other distinguished venues. His first book, The Frigid Golden Age, Climate Change, The Little Ice Age, and the Dutch Republic, 1560 to 1720, came out from Cambridge in 2018. The book challenges the conventional view of the Little Age as a period of unrelenting social catastrophe. Instead, Dagomar shows how the Dutch Republic actually flourished during this period, even while they struggled to overcome the environmental predicament. The Dutch were able to not only cope with the challenges presented by the cooler temperatures and extreme weather of the Little Ice Age, but also to exploit these conditions to their advantage in various areas such as commerce, warfare, and culture. One review remarked that at present this is arguably the premier book to have been produced on the historical interaction between climate, environment, weather, adaptation, and outcomes for human welfare. The review goes on to say that this is a book that will spawn many other books. The Frigid Golden Age was named one of the best history books of 2018 by Financial Times. The book also won the 2018 Atmospheric Science Librarian's International Choice Award for the best history book related to atmospheric science. Dagomar's second book, Ripples in the Cosmic Ocean, an environmental history of humanity's place in the solar system, is set to appear this year from Harvard with other uh, international imprints from Viking. The book argues that dynamic environments across the solar system have irrevocably influenced humanity in the last 500 years. I understand some features of, uh, from today's talk uh, can be found in this book. Dagomar was the lead author for, field, uh, for a field-making article that appeared in Nature in 2021, where they present an interdisciplinary framework for uncovering climate-society interactions and pathways of survival in the face of climate crisis. The article will reshape our understanding of the history of climate and society in a fundamental way. Author of numerous other articles, reviews, chapters, Dagomar is also the co-editor of three forthcoming volumes coming out this year and next year from Harvard, Cambridge, and Oxford. Apart from his academic publications, Dr. De Groot is a leading public intellectual and his works have appeared in Washington Post, The Conversation, and The Yon Magazine. He has been interviewed by the CNN, The Los Angeles Times, Popular Science, and Space.com. He is the founder and co-director of the historicalclimatology.com and the co-founder and co-director of the Climate History Network. Professor Dagomar de Groot is one of the foremost environmental historians of our time, and I feel very privileged to be able to welcome you here at Queen's today. Please welcome Dr. Dagomar de Groot. Well, thank you so much. I have to say that was probably the most detailed introduction I've ever received. I'm humble. Thank you. That was wonderful. And thank you also to the Sherwood family. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, now I have a new benchmark for teaching. I have to make sure that my students can sleep on my floor. I don't know how to manage in two months. Maybe in 10 years, I'll, I'll figure that out. Um, and it's a pleasure to be at Queens. My sister actually went here for a couple years during her undergrad. She's much older than I am. And as a little kid, I remember coming here and being impressed by the limestone buildings, which I know is still a point of pride uh, at Queens. It's a very beautiful campus. so. Uh, I'm really thrilled and honored to be back here uh, from Washington, D.C., where I have to say it is a lot warmer. <laughs> a lot warmer. I think I pulled something in my neck from shivering here. <laughs> so if my head is crooked, that, that is why. But uh, 
But I'm really excited to share a very strange story with you all. Uh, probably the strangest story I've come across in my research. And um, it, it feels maybe a little bit like science fiction. It has some similarities, I have to say, with some recent movies. Life, for example, and Sputnik. Have you seen these movies before? They terrified the hell out of me. So I, I do recommend them, especially Life. Uh, very disconcerting. But, uh, but in this case, actually, the story is based on science. And, you know, maybe it's not quite as strange as these movies, but it's still very similar. It's about an effort in the 1960s to protect the Earth from extraterrestrials. It was an effort that spanned the American government. The extraterrestrials were not UFOs. They were, in fact, microbes. And it was suspected that they might live on the moon. And at least many people in the federal government, in the US federal government, thought that Apollo astronauts who had been to the moon might bring those microbes back to Earth. And in this talk, I'm going to argue in the next hour, it will go a little bit long, to be honest. I, I will argue that, uh, first of all, many people in the federal government, and including NASA, took this threat seriously, and that their efforts to confront the threat were fundamentally flawed and would have failed if, in fact, microbes had existed on the moon. Luckily, they did not. So this is a story I've been working on for, for several years now. Um, I guess I came across it before my son was born, so it was about five years ago. Uh, I have memories of working through papers as I was holding my son late at night, from about 3 a.m., just looking through papers, trying to work at the same time. And it occupies a few pages in uh, Ripples on the Cosmic Ocean. I turned those pages into a popular article for Eon Magazine. That's kind of a blow-by-blow -blow account of what actually happened, how things went wrong. Um, it's a major theme in the book I'm working on right now with Asif Siddiqui, a, a historian of the Soviet space program. And it's, uh, it's, I covered it probably in the most detail in an article in the journal ISIS, which I published uh, last year. And that article received a lot of media attention. It was picked up by the New York Times, for example. And that in turn spawned dozens of articles um, all, all over the world, really. Um, and I think my favorite actually is on the right here by Leonard David. And one reason I think that it got the more, probably more media attention than anything I've written is because it seemed to have direct relevance for present day efforts to bring stuff back from other worlds, particularly Mars. NASA is planning to bring back rocks from Mars, and so is China's space program. So eventually, these rocks will find their way back to Earth. And it is possible that those rocks will have microbes in them. So it seemed like this story of failure in the 1960s might have some relevance for those efforts. But more importantly, in my view, and the New York Times article picks up on this, this is really a story about existential risks. Those are buzzwords that you've probably heard before. They're unfortunately uh, probably the buzzwords of our time. An existential risk seems to refer to some sort of threat, some danger that could bring humanity to extinction, could wipe out every single last one of us. So think about an asteroid, for example. Right? The dinosaurs were wiped out by an asteroid or a comet. Well, you know, we could be too. Or think about some kind of rogue artificial superintelligence that decides that we simply we simply cannot exist, right? So that, you might think of that as an existential risk. But the philosopher Toby Ord, I think, has a better definition. He defines existential risk as something that threatens humanity's long-term survival, or sorry, long-term potential. Meaning not just something that causes us all to be killed, but something that precludes our future flourishing. So for example, let's say climate change is about as bad as it can get this century. The worst emission scenarios say north of four degrees Celsius of heating. That would render large parts of the Earth uninhabitable, probably, for our species. Wouldn't kill us all, most likely, but it would certainly preclude our, us reaching our full potential on this planet. Um, or think of a total nuclear war between the United States and Russia probably wouldn't wipe out everybody. Maybe there'd be two billion people left, 
that's not really an ideal situation, obviously. And two billion people, it's unlikely that they would be able to build back everything we have now, right? So an existential risk is something that fundamentally and forever limits us. But this is also then a story about a related concept, which is a low likelihood, high consequence risks. And it might seem like this is very similar to existential risk. It, it is. A low likelihood, high consequence risk it's, of course, very unlikely to happen, but if it does happen, all hell breaks loose. And they're very, very difficult to deal with. In part, because most of them, at least, are unprecedented. They've never happened before. And so it's difficult to know just how likely they actually are now, and how bad they would be if they, in fact, do happen. So it's very, very difficult to actually assess these risks to figure out how bad they actually are. And that makes them very hard to balance against much more familiar risks, ones that have happened before. So you know roughly what they entail, how bad things could be if they actually do happen. And frankly, you know that they could happen. So this is really a story about risk management and how some risks ultimately in this program, in the Apollo program, were prioritized over other risks. Risks that were familiar, were dealt with. Risks that were unfamiliar, unlikely, potentially existential, were not. And as we'll see, I think that this story has something to tell us today as we seem to face a proliferating number of existential risks. Hopefully not, but maybe. OK. So the moon is probably the best place to start the story. By the 1950s, the space age began then, selenographers, astronomers who specialized on the moon, had for hundreds of years argued that the moon could harbor life. And in fact, they'd argued that changes in the appearance of the moon suggested the construction or destruction of lunar cities, for example, or the movement of swarms of insects, or uh, intelligent inhabitants of the moon actually harvesting fields and collecting their crops. Admittedly, by the 1950s, most of those theories had fallen by the wayside, and astronomers, in fact, increasingly concentrated on what happened beyond the solar system. If you did a poll of astronomers in the 50s, you'd probably find most of them thought that the moon was a dead world. But enough of them believed that the moon might harbor some microbes or even some plants, but that was certainly not a niche view. In fact, in the late 1950s, there were reputable reports of changes, again, on the lunar surface that seemed to have been caused by volcanic eruptions, or at least some kind of outgassing. So the moon was really a very mysterious world at the dawn of the space age, with the launch of Sputnik in 1957, and a world that still could plausibly harbor life. Now, you probably all know that the launch of Sputnik was primarily a military demonstration. It demonstrated the the power, the potential of the Soviet Union's uh, rocket forces in particular. And so shortly after its launch, some scientists worried that the Soviets might follow it up with an even more spectacular demonstration. They figured that if the Soviets sent a nuclear missile to the moon and detonated it on the lunar surface, the flash would be visible to a large part of Earth's population. And what better demonstration of military might could there be than that flash? In fact, we now know that Soviet engineers were planning to nuke the moon. And they had designed a nuclear warhead that could be fit onto a rocket and detonated on the moon. And one of the only reasons they didn't do that is because they suspected that the flash might not be visible from Earth after all. <laughs> At the same time, in the US Air Force, similar plans were unfolding, and very prominent scientists actually had been enlisted to work on these plans and to figure out what could be learned from a nuclear detonation on the moon. And there, too, there was skepticism that the flash would be seen from Earth and that discouraged further study. Now, this was actually, these were serious plans to launch a nuclear assault on the moon. Suspecting such a plan, a leading geneticist by the name of Joshua Lederberg who coined a new field, exobiology, he argued that the moon's environments should be protected. 
And his arguments were influential in the United States, in the National Academy of Sciences, for example. So he was placed in charge of a committee to recommend procedures for sterilizing moonbound spacecraft. It seems that, seemed that terrestrial microbes might be a problem, too, if they found their way to the moon. So his procedures for sterilization became enshrined within the Ranger program, the first American spacecraft to the moon, many of which failed. Uh, but some of which did actually crash land on the lunar surface. So at first then, he warned against forward contamination of the moon, as he called it, forward contamination, which is the contamination by microorganisms from Earth of other planetary environments, planetary biospheres. And this seemed to him like it would be a terrible tragedy if it happened. Because once you brought those terrestrial microbes to a new planetary biosphere and they started multiplying there, then you could never be sure that what you found on that other planet was, in fact, indigenous life. And that, in turn, seemed to preclude ever discovering whether there had been a second genesis, a second origin of life. That, in turn, would make it impossible to use this kind of research to figure out whether we were alone in the universe. So one of the greatest discoveries of all time would be ruined by forward contamination. Interestingly, the inherent value of other planetary biospheres didn't really enter into these calculations uh, at the time. Probably should have, but it didn't. But that contamination was potentially even more serious, even more dangerous. Now, Lederberg turned his focus on that contamination next. This referred to the contamination by microorganisms from other worlds, or by terrestrial microorganisms that have in some way been altered in space of Earth's biosphere. Lederberg feared that these microorganisms, when they were returned to Earth or brought to Earth for the first time, could multiply and fundamentally degrade our biosphere. So it was a good idea to prevent a bad contamination. Now, as you may know, in 1962, Kennedy famously issued his challenge to NASA to get people on the moon by the end of the decade. This then initiated the space race between the Soviet Union and the United States, two superpowers competing to figure out or to, to land somebody on the moon for the first time, and thereby to prove the superiority of their political and economic systems. Kennedy's goal made a mockery of attempts to prevent forward contamination. Each of us has about 40 trillion bacterial cells within our bodies. And in fact, we are shedding bacteria all the time, doing it all over the stage right now, unfortunately. <laughs> as soon as you bring one of us to another planet, forward contamination occurs, right? There's bacteria all over the place. So after JFK's challenge, uh, NASA stopped sterilizing its moonbound spacecraft. And that contamination was a different story entirely. Carl Sagan, on the left, was one of uh, Joshua Lederberg's protégés. Joshua Lederberg, in fact, introduced him to the corridors of power in Washington, DC, in the National Academy of Sciences. Sagan considered himself an exobiologist. He was also a protégé of Harold Urey, a Nobel Prize-winning chemist who, through experimentation, seemed to prove that in the right chemical cocktail, uh, organic building blocks like amino acids would sort of spontaneously emerge. And this seemed to suggest that, well, anywhere there's the right chemicals, you would start to see life. Sagan believed that the moon and the earth had once been very similar, with volatiles like water in an atmosphere. And of course, because of the moon's small size, gradually it lost its water, its atmosphere, it became a much more arid world. But he suspected that bacterial, bacteria could have evolved, maybe by creating spores, kind of armor that surrounds their DNA, and might still persist on the lunar surface or just under its surface. So with that in mind, he and uh, one of the first exobiologists, a microbiologist by the name of Wolf Vishniak, argued that the Apollo astronauts, the American astronauts who first landed on the moon, should actually conduct tests using Vishniak's contraption here on the right, the wolf trap, uh, which was supposed to test for microbial life. 
So he thought those tests should happen in situ on the moon before the astronauts were brought back to Earth. And he was motivated in this also um, by learning from William McNeil. Actually, William McNeil is the father of my colleague at, uh, at Georgetown, uh, John McNeil. And from William McNeil at the University of Chicago, Sagan had learned that Europeans, when they arrived in the Americas, for example, brought with them pathogens that indigenous people had had no experience with, no resistance to, no immunity. And that was part of the reason why so many people died with their first arrival, the arrival of Europeans. So now he feared that if he brought microbes back from the moon, of course, none of us would have any experience with those microbes, and the result could be even worse. Right? The, um, some sort of pandemic that was unrivaled in the history of humanity. So Sagan had begun to accrue power in Washington, D.C. and influence, and his warnings were taken seriously by many congressional representatives. And in fact, in um, um, a congressional meeting to set the budget for NASA in 1964, NASA officials were grilled by congressional representatives who wanted to know what the agency was doing about that contamination. The NASA officials assured them, we're going to make studies, we're going to make preparations, trust us, we got this. In fact, at the time, they were planning to bring samples back to the moon, and they were planning to store those samples in a simple clean room, probably smaller than this room, with no measures taken at all to prevent that contamination. In 1964, 30 representatives from across the American federal government, the Department of Agriculture, the US Army, um, Public Health Service, and CDC, which is part of the Public Health Service, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, joint NASA officials, and uh, outside scientists at universities for an unprecedented conference on bat contamination. And they all agreed that the threat was real, that it was possible that microbes existed on the moon, let alone Mars and Venus, and that if they were brought to Earth, it was possible that they would multiply rapidly in our lush biosphere and take it over in some way, or at least degrade it fundamentally, and even cause a pandemic that could kill millions and millions and millions of people. I thought it was possible. So, with that in mind, what then could be done? Could we resist this in some way? Well, I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> the curse seen now, you might not. But they concluded that it was very, very unlikely that we could come up with some effective weapon against a microbe brought back to Earth, some vaccine, for example. And we've all lived through a pandemic now, so this might not be surprising to us, uh, but do you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this article about when we might have a vaccine? And there was a particularly scary one in the New York Times that suggested it might be at least 10 years before it would have one. It didn't take into account the mRNA uh, technology, of course, we got the vaccine a lot earlier than that one, the great medical miracles, really, of, of all time. mRNA technology wasn't available in the 1960s, so they were right. Coming up with a vaccine in the face of potentially unknown threat from space was uh, very, very unlikely. So that was out of the picture. So then what could be done? Well, the problem was that nothing could be completely decontaminated. Even the Ranger spacecraft sent to the moon were not fully decontaminated. It still did harbor some microbes and their electronics, for example. And so as soon as you come to another planetary biosphere, if there are microbes, you're going to take those microbes back to Earth. It's inevitable. So they decided that if infection of the Earth by extraterrestrial ter organisms is possible, it will occur. So if there are microbes in another world, once we visit them and bring something back, that's it. <laughs> that contamination will happen. Okay, so the only thing to be done in the face of that threat would be to delay infection. So you want to do anything you can to prevent immediate contamination. That's the best that you can do. So how do you do that? 
Well, quarantine isn't great. So quarantine, so isolating anything you bring back to Earth, that's not a perfect solution. Again, think, you, know, you can't completely sterilize anything, right? So eventually, quarantine is going to fail. So that's not a perfect solution. It's also a necessary first step. Right? So it's not a perfect solution, but it's really the best you can do, the best thing that you can do, at least at first. How long should the quarantine be? How long should things be sealed off after they're brought back to Earth? Well, people who are particularly gung-ho about the back contamination risk said five weeks. But of course, there were also NASA officials here, the more practically minded, so they settled arbitrarily on three weeks. Three-week quarantine should be enough to determine whether, in fact, dangerous microorganisms had been brought back to Earth. Now, astronauts, for example, might fall sick within three weeks. So that should be enough. Okay, all of this, by the way, happened uh, in private. The public didn't know about it. And as far as I can tell, elected policymakers were not informed about these deliberations at all. Still, in the wake of uh, this conference, senior NASA administrators started meeting with uh, senior regulators from across the federal government, and the PHS, for example, uh, with James Goddard, director of the CDC, or Alan Fong, the assistant surgeon general of the CDC, <coughs> headquarters in the 60s on the left here. And in their meetings, they hashed out several important concepts. So this is a, a memo of one of their meetings, but there were, there were several. And I really don't think you can see that at the back, so I, I'll not just say what's up here. With, with, with highlighting to show that some things are important, others are not. <laughs> so the first thing that they agreed is that the public health service and the Department of Agriculture, they were responsible for the health of Americans uh, and economically important plants and animals. So it was their responsibility, ultimately, to tell NASA what to do in the face of the back contamination threat. By the way, this is actually even more important and kind of implicit here, but they also agreed that back contamination was a threat in the first place. Right? So I forgot to highlight that, but that's actually even more important. And then they agreed that a quarantine would be necessary. So you have to put anything that comes back from the moon, you have to put it in quarantine. And that includes the astronauts, any rocks that they bring back, and their spacecraft. All of it has to go into quarantine. Now, at first, they decided that that quarantine could not happen in the United States. It had to happen at some isolated forward receiving station where the first people exposed would not be Americans. Okay, but ultimately, <laughs> not Canada, Canada was not under consideration, but some island somewhere, whatever, you know, that was okay. But uh, not Americans, that's for sure. But eventually they relented, because NASA really wanted to have this quarantine station at the manned spacecraft facility, uh, sorry, center in Houston. And that was because astronauts that were in quarantine could then speak to astronauts that were going to the moon and help plan future missions more effectively. So the Public Health Service relented. They could build the quarantine facility in Houston. The PHS also established a very important committee, the Interagency Advisory Committee on Bat Contamination, or ICBC. And this committee included people from really important regulators from across the federal government, scientists. So eventually it included ICB, uh, sorry, Chief of the CDC, David Sensor, and the Assistant Chief of the CDC, and representatives from the Department of Agriculture and Interior, outside scientists, scientists uh, who are actually associated with the National Academy of Sciences, including Wolf Ishniak, and about half of its members were from NASA centers, so NASA officials. So this was the committee then that collectively would establish the procedures that NASA had to follow in order to protect the Earth from back contamination. The committee to save the world, uh, if you will. Now, it became obvious through the first ICBC meetings that NASA needed much more than the clean room NSC engineers had originally envisioned. It needed an unprecedented facility. Something that, like the US Army's biological laboratories at Fort Detrick, 
could keep anything inside it from getting out, but also something that at the same time could keep anything from without from getting in. So it had to fulfill these dual roles. And nothing like that facility had ever been imagined, let alone constructed. Eventually, NASA engineers proposed an 80,000 square foot complex that would be called the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. This is a, a 3D cutout that appeared later in Life magazine. And this complex would be staffed by hundreds of people and cost well over 100 million in present day currency to construct. It consisted of three different parts. In white, that's the administrative <laughs> wing and the administrative offices. In uh, yellow, that's the crew reception area. So that's where the astronauts would be quarantined and their spacecraft, which you can see uh, in white right here, the command module. It kind of looks like a cone. That's what was brought back to Earth, a capsule. And then in green, that's the lunar sample laboratory. And here, geologists and chemists and physicists would actually test lunar samples. Right? But also biologists would ground up the samples, the rocks, into dust and then introduce them to plants, to individual cells, to mice, to quails, to animals, to dozens of different species to see if any organism had an adverse reaction to the dust. And if they did, within the three weeks of quarantine, then of course, bad news. <laughs> <laughs> that, contam that contamination could occur. So here you see some scenes from uh, the Lunar Sample Laboratory, um, some testing on plants over here. You can see the amount of security at the top there. Um, and some scenes from the crew reception area. That is where the astronauts stayed, which is not quite as nice as my hotel room, I, I have to say. <laughs> it looks a bit depressing. Um, and then here, this is the spacecraft in quarantine, the com uh, command module, the capsule that returned to Earth. Here's another cutout of the lunar receiving laboratory. Again, the crew reception area now is in red. A lunar sample laboratory is in uh, green, and the administrative offices in white. This is where the spacecraft was kept. And you'll see that there's a dark outline because the entire facility was supposed to be sealed off by a bio barrier. And then each of these different parts were also sealed off. So the crew reception had a, had a separate bio barrier, and the sample laboratory also a separate bio barrier. barrier. Now, to enter into these separate parts, you have to go through that blue space there, which is um, the changing rooms. But they were not like changing rooms at your gym. You had to actually pass through an ultraviolet filter to get in. And then to get out, you have to strip down naked, pass through the filters, your clothes would also be decontaminated, and you have to shower. So, in theory at least, it would be harder to leave than it was to enter, enshrining kind of the importance of back contamination in the complex. In yellow, you'll see a few different offices, which was staffed by a quarantine control officer. And anytime there was a spill, a containment breach, the quarantine control officer would be notified and then decide what action should be taken. That are to send people, for example, uh, from the lunar sample laboratory into the crew reception area where they would be quarantined for three weeks. So it was, um, this is just kind of scratching the surface. It was a whole elaborate procedure uh, that was worked out at the same time as the complex was designed. So Congress ultimately approved funding for the complex because NASA assured them that the PHS demanded it. This is at the time of the the Johnson administration's war on poverty and the expanding Vietnam War. So NASA budgets overall were plummeting. Still, Congress agreed to get $100 million in present day currency for this complex. They delayed funding, however, so it was late 1966 when finally NASA began to build the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. And if you remember, Apollo 11, the first landing on the moon, happened in July 1969. So, <laughs> Things were pretty tense. And in fact, NASA had no time to actually plan out fully the complex before starting construction. So it was actually, plans were in flux as it was being built. Also, different scientists had different requirements. So there was a lot of tension and, frankly, a lot of chaos. One of the key points of contention 
involve geologists and biologists. The geologists wanted there to be more air pressure in the complex than its surroundings, because that would push out any microbes or contaminants that might have gotten in from outside, from Earth's biosphere. The biologists didn't like that very much, as you can imagine. They wanted negative air pressure, so that things wanted to move in rather than out. Ultimately, the biologists actually prevailed in this fight, infuriating not only geologists, but chemists, physicists, actually including that a mentor of Sagan's, Harold Urey. So in theory, at least, the LRL was being designed in a way that didn't enshrine back contamination as an important priority. But that began to falter pretty fast. In part, because NASA officials decided to design the facility safeguards around Yersinia pestis, uh, the pathogenic agent responsible for bubonic plague. It seems that was largely for PR. Yersinia pestis is very scary. And everybody thinks, well, what's the most dangerous thing that you can face? It's bubonic plague, right? But Yersinia pestis also is a large, complex bacterium, exactly the opposite of what scientists thought they'd find on the moon. It doesn't form bacterial spores, again, like what scientists thought might exist on the moon. It doesn't readily pass through the air, infect people through the air, different from what people fear on the moon. It's uh, very exquisitely attuned to a single organism, the tropical bat flea. That was not what people expected on the moon either. So and there's no fleas probably on the moon. <laughs> people didn't know. So really, in many respects, this was a theatrical cho uh, choice. It was, um, it was for public consumption rather than actually designing the best possible safeguards. And actually, I left out one thing which is the most important. But handling your senior pestis requires you to use a lower biosafety level um, safeguards than the LRL, the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, was designed for. That was designed for the maximum possible biosafety level. And you don't get that with your senior pestis. So, a chemist by the name of John Hodge proposed something really quite, uh, I don't know if you can call it wise or crazy, or maybe both. He proposed testing the facility with the pathogenic agent responsible for Q fever. And there had many advantages over Yersinia pestis. It forms spores, it travels by air, and it seems just very similar to what might exist on the lunar surface. The only problem was that Hodge suggested using a live agent to make sure that NASA officials, their hearts were really in it. And as you can imagine, managers at the manned spacecraft um, center were not fans of that proposal, like Robert Gilbert, for example, thought it was crazy. And he thought that the proposal showed that NASA should sort of go its own way, make its own procedures. NASA officials knew best, and outside experts should at best only suggest um, procedures to follow. But they should not actually have any sort of power to enforce compliance from NASA. Now, many officials at NASA felt the same way, and that has something to do with how they analyzed risk in the first place. They popularized a method for analyzing risk developed by the US Air Force called failure mode and effects analysis. This is sort of a step-by-step -step process that's really good for identifying risk in complex technical systems. And so using this process, they were great at identifying risks to machines and to astronauts, but it didn't really work for thinking through potentially you know, unlikely, but really existential risks to the entire biosphere. Experts from a regulatory agency or scientists use those more qualitative, more abstract ways of assessing risk. In addition, people like Gilruth had sort of a visceral experience of what could happen if um, this sort of methodology was not followed to the T, and you know, if anything interfered with how they designed the spacecraft. Um, and I think Gus Grissom, you can see here, is a good example of that. He was one of the Mercury astronauts, and his capsule almost flooded, he almost drowned when he splashed down the Pacific Ocean. And then tragically, in Apollo 1, he died because of uh, pure oxygen, high-pressure environment in the spacecraft that started a fire. So NASA managers were very loath to interfere in any way with something that could 
jeopardize the lives of the astronauts and the performance of their machines. And they didn't, for that reason, want preparations for back contamination in any way to interfere with those uh, technical systems that their astronauts depended upon. Anyway, in 1968, finally, the Lunar Receiving Laboratory was complete, more or less, and testing began. Here you can see Gilroth with one of the bio cabinets. These were supposed to be sealed, and you would stick your hands through these gloves to manipulate any lunar samples, for example. And here you can see Neil Armstrong actually also receiving a tour of these beautiful bio cabinets with their gloves uh, sticking out. What NASA managers like Gilworth expected was that the ICBC officials would test the RL, basically give it a rubber stamp, and it would be smooth sailing all the way to Apollo. In fact, <laughs> that did not occur. Testing in October 1968, first of all, was delayed by faulty autoclaves. Autoclaves are really important to contamination machine where you expose anything you want to decontaminate to very hot water. But all the cases were faulty, it delayed the testing, and then when the testing occurred, 82 problems, including leaky, leaky bio cabinets. These things actually didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, in December 1968, there's another round of testing. Now there's 140 <laughs> problems. <clears throat> and Hodge blames those problems on sh sloppy management. So there's a, a reorganization at the Mad Spacecraft Center. There's new people in charge. David Setzer, the chair of the ICBC, warns them, you've got to focus on back contamination now. It's only a few months before Apollo 11. There's another round of testing in February 1969, really just a few months before the mission. Every single lab had a containment failure, and literally every single mouse died, <laughs> including the control mice. Everything dies. <laughs> mouse apocalypse. <laughs> so we've now scramble, of course, to, to implement improvements. But from March to April 1969, now there are 30 problems, and the testers say that drastic changes are still required. Again, the first mission is July 1969. And those are the last comprehensive tests that are done. But in May 1969, the autoclaves still they keep failing. They're still not steam certified. And there are additional problems into June. However, the ICBC actually certifies the LRLs being ready to use just before Apollo 11. Even though there's not another round of testing to show up any additional problems that might occur. Now all of this, a lot of this for a while, happened outside the public eye. It wasn't picked up by journalists. Until late 1968, when a new pathogen was identified in Hong Kong, H3N2. And fear of a Hong Kong flu spread through the United States. <laughs> then, in the late 1968, that flu arrives, the extreme uh, pandemic arrives in the US, and by February, tens of thousands of people have died. You can see um, you know, the extreme N2 zoomed up and left here. So now there's a wave of articles about a potential pathogen, you know, a pan pandemic with an even more distant origin the moon instead of Hong Kong. But what really focuses public attention is the publication just weeks, I think, no months, before Apollo 11 of the Andromeda strain by Michael Crichton. I don't know how many of you have read the book. Some of you might have seen the movie, more, roughly more. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's actually a pretty good read, I have to say. Um, but you may remember that uh, in the book, um, there is an extraterrestrial pathogen that lands on Earth, and there's a kind of, obviously, a crack team of scientists that has to contain it in the wildfire facility. That facility is completely based on the lunar receiving laboratory. In fact, Brighton cites uh, technical manuals from the LRL in the book. So now there's an outpouring of public concern. NASA receives literally thousands and thousands of letters that they have to try and respond to, and it's just an absolute crisis. So NASA did what it did exceptionally well in the 1960s, which is public relations. And here, it's really fascinating to compare what NASA officials said privately with what they told the public. So John E. Pickering, for example, was a colonel in the US Air Force and a very important official in the Apollo program at NSC, the Spacecraft Center. 
You, I'm sure you cannot read any of this, so you just have to take my word for it. To be honest, I can barely read it here on, on the screen. But um, in February, late February, February 24th, he said, internally then, our LRL is not yet ready. Our people are not yet trained, and we in all likelihood are going to try to do things beyond our capabilities. We are short of people, mostly technicians, in terms of our uh, mammalian testing protocol for mice or testing mice, it is, um, it is deficient. So this is when all the mice had died. <laughs> Doesn't work. And time is running out. And so this is what he said internally for NASA consumption. Now, a couple months later, he had a, a, press, a, a news briefing, so a press, press briefing. And here he said something rather different. He assured the public um, the lunar receiving facility and our quarantine procedures are well beyond the current state of the art. And the overall effort has resulted in a laboratory with capabilities which have never previously existed. The testing program, he says, was unparalleled in its scope and complexity. So that's what he tells the public. Now, he's right. right? It's true, but obviously it's not the whole story. Right? So the whole story never reached the public. And as far as I can tell, it never reached any elected policymaker either. What he also didn't tell the public was that internally within NASA, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty about what the ICBC's purpose actually was. ICBC members who were not also part of NASA thought that they were part of a regulatory committee, meaning that they had to approve every relevant aspect of the Apollo program, anything that could cause back contamination. But senior managers within NASA, like yours, saw the ICBC was an advisory committee, or at least should be an advisory committee. They could offer recommendations, they could rubber test you know, the ICBC, but that was it. Now, a couple months before Apollo 11, they settled on an uneasy compromise. It's a very bizarre compromise. So the ICBC would not take action that affected the lunar program without the unanimous consent of its members, half of whom were obviously NASA officials. While NASA would approach the ICBC before undertaking actions that risked contamination unless it considered those actions necessary to protect its astronauts and spacecraft. So of course, in theory, well, one way you might say this enshrines the power of the ICPC, it has to approve everything. In reality, of course, it makes the ICPC nothing more than an advisory body, but an advisory body that includes very, very important regulators, like the head of the CDC. And for that reason, NASA still kind of had to take it seriously. So it's a very kind of messy arrangement. And that showed up with how NASA approached the broader quarantine protocol. As you can imagine, if when the astronauts arrived on Earth, they, well, they splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, if then they are simply transported to the LRL, then the LRL has no point, right? Because immediately, as they, when they land on Earth, they've got the lunar microbes with them, if any exist, and they're just getting those things all over the place, right? So what you need to do is you need to actually isolate them as soon as they touch Earth's atmosphere, and keep them isolated until they're behind quarantine, their spacecraft, their samples, the astronauts themselves, um, in the RL. So the ICBC had worked out a procedure for this. First, the command module that they come back in had to be completely sealed, completely sealed. Then it had to be picked up by well, a crane on an aircraft carrier and brought on the deck of the aircraft carrier. Then personnel had to extend an impervious tunnel between the command module and a mobile quarantine facility, which is basically just a trailer, a sealed trailer. And finally, that sealed trailer had to be put in an aircraft, flown to the LRL, driven, and then there'd be another tunnel, and they would have to go through that tunnel into the LRL. No contact with the outside world. In fact, NASA worked out its own procedures that did not involve a crane, that involved venting the command module as soon as it hit the water, that involved the astronauts coming out of the command module. Remember that experience in the Mercury program where the, command, where the capsule flooded. Right? So they didn't want to have that. 
And they didn't want the astronauts to be poisoned by a potential buildup of carbon dioxide. So the astronauts were able to just leave the command module. Then they'd be picked up. A helicopter would pick up the command module. Um, they would get on the aircraft carrier completely open, right? And they would walk into then the mobile quarantine facility. So in all those cases, there would be a breach in containment. So the ICBC realized this with very little time to spare before Apollo 11. And they demanded changes, and NASA disagreed. They said changes were now impossible. <clears throat> so ICBC representatives either notified their regulatory agencies or they approached the press, and a wave of articles appeared, uh, some really uh, big ones in the New York Times, for example, that warned that now there's danger from the moon, that there's a breach in the quarantine protocol, and that Earth could be exposed. Eventually, in response to this, with about a month left before the Apollo 11 mission, NASA hashed out a somewhat different procedure. Now, the capsule would be vented, still, but 10,000 feet over the Pacific Ocean. And the astronauts would still open the hatch and leave, but first, Navy divers would throw down biological isolation garments, or BIGs. You can see them right here, the astronauts in the BIGs. And then the capsule would be taken by helicopter and placed onto the aircraft carrier. So it's in the BIGs that, um, that the astronauts would enter the mobile quarantine facility, and then everything would be sprayed by, by acid. So the hatch would be sprayed by acid, and where the astronauts walked, all acid. So this seemed like a better procedure. In reality, of course, the capsule is still vented. Whether it's vented in the Pacific Ocean or 10,000 feet up, if there's any microbes, they're going to find their way into Earth's biosphere, potentially. And it turned out that the BIGs were leaky. <laughs> so it was really quite pointless. The scientists also, even at the time, argued that, well, what if an astronaut falls into the ocean, for example, before putting on a BIG? What would happen then? There was no real answer. But at least the ICBC, there they are in the quarantine facility, the mm -hmm. President Nixon. Some members of the ICBC were assuaged by NASA's changes. Carl Sagan, however, and some other scientists pointed out an even bigger problem. NASA's procedures for the LRL stipulated that if an astronaut got really sick, then quarantine would be breached and the astronaut would be taken to hospital. Of course, Something that could make the astronaut sick would be a microbe from the moon, right? So in the worst possible case scenario, the astronaut would actually be released from quarantine. And other things weren't even noticed, like uh, the procedures also stipulated that in the event of a fire, then quarantine would be breached because everybody would evacuate the building. Right? So there's, there's all these examples where it's clear it hadn't been thought fully through. Nevertheless, as we all know, Apollo 11 lifted off, we came back to Earth, and here are the astronauts in their mobile quarantine facility. Before they arrived at the LRL, their films, their film cassettes arrived. And as technicians opened them for the first time, first of all, they were still having problems with the autoclaves. But second of all, a shower of dust awaited them. They were immediately exposed to moon dust. Here, the first exposed technicians, they were shunted off to quarantine. And they were actually there before the astronauts even arrived. <laughs> in fact, so many people were exposed in the coming weeks that when Neil Armstrong celebrated his birthday, he had quite a crowd to celebrate with him. <laughs> These are all in quarantine. Everybody here is in quarantine. Meanwhile, there was a kind of lackadaisical attitude um, in the lunar sample laboratory where it was clear from interviews that technicians didn't actually take the threat of back contamination seriously. And there was this one incident after another after another. This is a table of stills, leaks, containment breaches. And just two weeks after um, the astronauts get back, as you can see, there's just a steady drumbeat of these containment failures and people heading, marching into quarantine one after another. This is maybe a little bit harder to understand and harder to see from the back, but it's my attempt to create a table of all the breaches that occurred and how likely the biosphere would have been to have been affected um, if, in fact, lunar microbes did exist. And the short story is many, many breaches, 
And the biosphere almost certainly would have been affected by any sort of dangerous microbe brought back from the moon. After three weeks, the astronauts left quarantine. And before too long, Apollo 12 lifted off and landed next to the Surveyor 3 robotic lander on the moon's surface. Pete Conrad, you can see here, detached the camera housing from that robot so that scientists on Earth could figure out how human technology responded to the lunar environment. Camera housing was brought back to Earth in the LRL to be examined here. And after the three-week quarantine period, scientists decided to figure out whether there could be any bacteria within the camera housing. And they found that, in fact, yes, there was bacteria inside of the camera housing. And of course, this was the nightmare scenario that the whole quarantine procedure had been designed for. And so they exposed mice to the bacteria, and the mice were OK. And eventually, they figured out it's actually Streptococcus uh, mitis, which is kind of a benign uh, bacterium that lives in the human throat. It's possible that it was contaminated, the camera housing, in the LRL itself. There's grainy video that shows technicians not following proper procedures while they're manipulating the camera housing. And in fact, one implement that they use, they put down on a bench um, before using it on camera housing. So sterile, sterile, a sterile situation, this was not. However, there are other reasons to believe that that bacterium had been introduced by a technician working on Surveyor 3 itself. It was found, for example, deep within the camera housing. And it seems most likely right now that, in fact, it had survived for years on the lunar surface. So that then did suggest that bacteria could endure for a long time on the surface of the moon, even though indigenous bacteria, fortunately, were not found there. So to conclude, I, I want to give you two quotes that I think sum up a lot. The first is from Wolf Vishniak. Um, in 1969, just before <laughs> Apollo 11, and he wrote to the head of the NAS, who was uh, in the National Academy of Sciences. And he wrote, I'm frankly at a loss to suggest what should be done at this moment. And this is when all these tests are going wrong, all kinds of problems. Okay. Clearly, the Apollo, the Apollo program is moving at a pace which we cannot stop. It is equally clear that this irresistible progress is being used to brush aside the inconvenient restraints which the interagency committee has considered to be an essential part of the quarantine program. So here, a pioneering exobiologist <coughs> saying, we cannot stop this. We want to stop it, but we can't do it. There's too much pressure. And You'll remember Kennedy set a goal of getting to the moon by the end of the decade. It was halfway through 1969. Right? So slowing things down is really not an option. And then Pete Conrad, in his typical style, looking back in 1991, I always thought the most significant thing that ever found the whole goddamn moon was that little bacteria who came back and lived and nobody ever said shit about it. <laughs> and that's true. This, this story has really been treated, if it's treated at all in histories of the Apollo program, like a kind of amusing sideshow. But I think it's actually really important. Because if you climb into the heads of people at the time, you can see that they really thought this was a dangerous risk. And it was, in my opinion, fundamentally mismanaged. So I do uh, work with policymakers or policy advisors, and I like to try at least to come up with lessons from some of the scholarship that I do, lessons that can inform present day policy making. So what then can we learn from this history? Well, the first thing I would say is that, that risks have to be, existential risks, they need to be transparently communicated. And I think actually that's where NASA failed in the 1960s most spectacularly. It made sense to prioritize the risks that they decided to prioritize. But because they did not communicate that they were prioritizing some risks over others, they really ended up, in my opinion, deceiving the public and deceiving <coughs> policymakers and creating a kind of quarantine protocol that was theatrical. It didn't really work, and they realized that there were breaches in it. Also, then, oversight, any sort of oversight that's intended to avoid certain risks, existential risks, needs to be empowered. It needs to actually be able to force compliance. And that empowerment needs to be sustained. And that's one thing that really changed in the 1960s, too. And NASA managers decided 
hey, this ICBC, it's really more of an advisory body rather than a regulatory one. And even the very senior regulators who were part of the ICBC were not able to push back on it. There was just too much momentum in the Apollo program, too much at stake as the United States tried to secure a victory in the space race. The Soviet Unions were testing out their N1 rocket. It wasn't going well, but as far as the United States knew, it was possible that the Soviets would arrive first. So the oversight of the ICBC was not sustained. And then I think when it comes to mitigating existential risk, compromise can actually be a real problem. If you're trying to find a middle ground between prioritizing these unlikely but catastrophic risks versus the likely but not as catastrophic risks, that you can end up with is the worst of all possible worlds. You can end up with a semblance that you are actually seriously addressing existential risk, but it's only theater. It gives people a false sense of security that they really should not have. So in that sense, I think compromise can be a danger. Competition can also um, exacerbate existential risks, in my opinion. In this case, we're talking about competition between governments, right? And because they both wanted to get to the moon first, well, the United States, at least, was willing to risk a little bit of, um, of a threat to the entire biosphere. And then lastly, it's really important to cultivate kind of culture of safety, a safety culture in those people who are in charge of actually implementing procedures to defend against existential risk, or really any risk. NASA had a safety culture when it came to um, risks to machines or to astronauts, but at the LL, that culture was clearly might be deficient. Now, I've been thinking a little bit about this recently um, with reference to what happened at OpenAI. I, I don't know how many of you follow this, but um, OpenAI is the creator of ChatGPT, of course. And uh, its CEO, who's about my age, Samuel Altman, uh, has a lot more money than me, as I understand it. <laughs> but uh, he was forced out uh, recently by an oversight board that included uh, one of my colleagues, actually, at Georgetown. Why was he forced out? Because he wasn't being transparent apparently. At least that's the best I know right now. And why was he not being transparent? Because he didn't tell the board, seemingly, about something called Q-star, which is an evolution of these large language models that is much more capable than anything that has come before it. So he was forced out, but the oversight obviously did not work, because he had the loyalty of just about everybody in the company. He was able to come back and essentially kick out the overseers, right? They were fired. Why? Because of this competition between companies. They are trying to make money. Ultimately, a company tries to make money, right? It's no surprise. And so developing more and more potent LLMs is a great way of doing that. Slowing development because you're worried about existential risk, not a very good way of doing that. Now, LLMs might not pose any sort of existential risk. It may be that artificial general intelligence or super intelligence is just a pipe dream and uh, unlikely to happen in this century. That may very well be the case. But there are, I think, some disturbing similarities here between what happened in the 60s about a risk that wasn't real and what's happening now in the AI space for risks that may very well be real. We just don't know. Anyway, thank you so much. Sorry I went a little bit long.